yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for connecting. Where, where's your uh, the fez cap today? Oh yeah, that's so. Uh, let me. Yeah, I should probably should get it. <laughs> okay. One second. Which one is we'll talk about Bruno. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brother, so, I wasn't yeah. suggesting that you had to wear it. I wasn't suggesting. I was just asking where it was. <laughs> yeah, well, I just uh, I just had the beanie on today. I just want to make good. sure you didn't forget it anywhere. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, I'm not going to let you out as me. <laughs> You're not gonna outfaz me, brother. Yeah, but it looks better on you because uh, I think I need more full uh, hair or something. I got like you. Yeah. I got you. Praise a lot. Praise a lot. <laughs> um, I was gonna say um, before we get started, just um, you know, please feel free, uh, you know, to ask whatever questions. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not claiming to be, you know, the expert on more science. So I, I don't. Uh, I'm not going to try to pretend like I have all the answers, uh, but, you know, uh, my intention is to build more understanding. Um, personally, I want to understand Islam better and um, understand the Quran and the, the message the Prophet Muhammad sent to us, peace be upon him. But as a, on a larger scale, I'm really focused on bridging the gap between different communities in particular with our brothers and sisters who are Muslim, um, because it's really needed, you know, especially our community, Moorish Americans, the Moors, um, we need a lot of help. You know what I mean? And, and um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I, actually I do have some questions because it is always good to clarify. And, you know, yet at the same time, I do believe that I have the correct Islam, right? I, I, that's what I believe, but I'm open to learning. I certainly, I certainly don't claim to be an expert on Islam, certainly not an expert on Moore's Science Temple. So I do have actually a couple of questions for you. And uh, maybe th like that would be a good place to begin is that, could you explain uh, to me in, if it's possible in a couple of minutes, if, if you need five minutes, go for it. But like, what exactly is Moore's Science Temple organization? And, uh, what is the purpose of its existence? And to kind of address your own question, what is that gap? What, what do you feel is that gap between your organization and where the majority of Muslims, Sunni Muslims stand? What, what is that gap exactly? That's a beautiful question. Um, in terms of more Science Temple of America, uh, Noble Draw Lee, actually, we have what is called uh, Moorish Literature, which is a compilation of um, different articles that uh, was produced during the time that he was alive. And uh, one of them, uh, just give me a second, he actually uh, wrote, you know, like a short essay, if you will, on the Moorish Science Temple of America, just to give people um, that understanding. Um, and so I just read it real briefly. Morris leaders historical message to man. I can send the link to you so you can read yeah. it yourself. Um, uh, in connection with the aims, objects, rules, and regulations of the Morris Science Temple of America, I deem it proper to submit to you a brief statement of our organization covering its inception, rise, and progress of the Mohammedan religion, um, uh, Islam. Uh, uh, back then, they were sometimes referring to as the Mohammedan religion, um, just just for context. Um, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch, which I hope will be satisfactory to you and be the means of causing you at all times to adhere to the principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice in your relations with mankind in general. Uh, further down, we organized the Moore Science Temple in, in 1925 and were legally incorporated as a civic organization under the laws of the state of Illinois, November 29th, 1926. The Morris Temple of Science changed the Morris Science Temple of America, May 1928, in accordance with legal requirements of the Secretary of the State of Illinois. The object of our organization is to help in the great program of uplifting fallen humanity and teaching those things necessary to make our members better citizens. So, I mean, it, it, it goes in depth, you know, a little bit more, but just to summarize, it really... Uh, 
the organization organization was to create it to be a vehicle so that we could learn about our religion as well as our history or you know the knowledge our ancestry um, who we are as a people um, because uh, our people we went through enslavement if you you know for those that may not know uh, so-called black people so-called african americans um, we were also referred to as negroes afro-americans black americans people of color etc um, all of those names were placed on us uh, due to our enslavement and as a result we lost our culture we lost our religion we lost you know our true our true uh, our nationality and our identity um, and so this organization in Noble Drali came to uh, essentially restore that to us. Okay, so then j just to be clear then, what I had said on EF Dawa that day, um, was that correct? Because Moorish Science Temple was founded in the 1920s. So is it correct then to say that this was the predecessor to the Nation of Islam in America? Uh, and it was the first organizational attempt amongst what the rest of us refer to as African-Americans, right? I, and you, you, you refer to as Moors. This was the first attempt amongst Blacks in America on an organizational level to create some kind of Muslim or Islamic movement. Again, from the perspective of mainstream Muslims, a, a pseudo-Islamic movement that got some things right, that might have some things wrong. From your perspective, a, a Muslim movement to return back to the roots of Islam. But it was the predecessor to Nation of Islam. Am I right about that? Correct. Um, correct. It originally, um, our records, we uh, have the, the first uh, temple opened in 1913 under the name Canaanite Temple. Um, and then over a series of years and developments and changes, it moved from Newark, New Jersey in 1913 um, to the main, uh, the headquarters in Chicago in 1925. And that's when it changed from, uh, through that process, Canaanite Temple to what we now know as the Moore Science Temple of America. And uh, yeah, just, just to uh, confirm or add on to what you said, uh, it would be the first uh, quote unquote uh, and I say so-called Black or so-called African-American just because we don't necessarily subscribe to those terms, but it would be the first um, Muslim or Islamic movement uh, specifically, you know, for so-called, or coming from so-called Black people, I should say, rather. Now, one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons, as, as you know very well, I'm sure, because in America, I'm sure you are rubbing shoulders with uh, Sunni Muslims probably quite often. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you had uh, a, a regular, you know, Orthodox Muslim, even somewhere in your family or a cousin, a friend somewhere. Um, and obviously the, the, the largest group, the largest group of so-called black Americans who claim to be Muslim are in fact Sunni Muslim, right? So, I mean, um, like just to give us a context, what are what are the numbers? Does the Moorish Science Temple reveal any numbers? Because Nation of Islam doesn't. Nation of Islam, a lot of extra experts estimate that it, it, the card carrying members of Nation of Islam might only be 10, 20,000. It's, it's hard to know for two reasons, right. because one, the NOI doesn't release any official numbers. And number two, Farah Khan has, Minister Farah Khan of Nation of Islam has a far reaching influence way beyond his organization. So when he has um, when he has the uh, Savior's Day event conference, it's not only Nation of Islam uh, believing members, card carrying members who come. Other people come. I've seen more Science Temple people attend uh, Farah Khan's Savior's Day event. You guys stand out for obvious reasons. And uh, I was <laughs> I was at one of the Savior's Day events oh, in Detroit, right. just out of curiosity. Again, I'm not obviously not a Nation of Islam member, but just wanted to attend. So uh, what about more Science Temple? Do you guys revealed numbers and i know that more science temple has also split into some different denominations or opposing groups so how would you try to estimate the numbers would you, would you lump all of them together and give us some kind of estimate or is it just too difficult to do to, 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 to on our side as you know from our side in america there's about six million uh muslims uh majority of whom are sunni muslim and out of that six million at least two million are black American Muslims, like African American Muslims. So Oops. people like Malcolm X, people like Imam Warthuddin Muhammad, 
um, I thought that was the rapture there, and you just disappeared because all I saw was this guy. You know, you know the Christian rapture there. I thought he just. <laughs> so, um, people like Muhammad Ali and and the boxer Muhammad Ali and his descendants and his grandchildren. So they make up about two million. Uh, Sunni Muslims who are uh, so-called African American, Afro American, Black American. So, what about your your numbers? Um, unfortunately, that is uh, too difficult to to figure out at this time. Uh, you know, just being completely transparent, the organization has uh, it has really uh, become stagnant and uh, fractured, and uh, just quite honestly, we have lost our way in terms of following the original, um, the original outline or the original goal of the organization. Um, and that is why you have the confusion that you do if you try to look up or just find some basic information about the Moore Science Temple of America. You can't, you can't, you know, sincerely speaking, you can't look to one website to say, okay, this is the official website of the organization or these are the official leaders um, within the organization um, so unfortunately it's really difficult at this time to know the current numbers you know when i was doing research to really get into the historical aspect of the organization and just try to get some facts as opposed to just trying to go off beliefs i was uh doing research they have some documents on the fbi's website um, uh, from the Freedom of Information request, uh, some documents from back then um, that said, you know, there's estimates at that time, there was almost about 100,000 members or, you know, some estimates of numbers, uh, you know, but then subsequently after uh, Prophet Noble Dralee passed, things became splintered. And that's actually where the base of Nation of Islam, uh, their members come from. And, and even uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan, um, he, he has uh, admitted as such, you know, in, in several clips that, you know, the members from the Morris Science Temple of America moved into the Nation of Islam, uh, you know, after Noble Dralee passed. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some of, the, you know, their numbers, I think if you were to, you know, do some digging, you would see were originally Morris Science Temple of America members also. So when you talk about building bridges <clears throat> and narrowing the gap. Uh, yeah, or what is that gap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, and I'll let you answer that. But as you talk about that on a communal level, historically, um, we could say arguably we could say that that bridge has already been built and crossed by many. Because, as you said, uh, back in the heyday in the 20s and 30s, uh, probably 20s, I guess, more Science Temple could have had up to 100,000 members. The majority of them joined the Nation of Islam. And there's some evidence, by the way, to indicate that even uh, the one that uh, the NOI calls Master Fard Muhammad, their founder, he himself may have been a member of Moore Science Temple. So he may have gotten some of his ideas, some of his theological points, possibly from Moore Science Temple. So the majority of the Moors became Nation of Islam. And then, and I'm saying this more for the clarity of anyone who might be watching this, because a lot of people don't know, in 1975, the majority of the nation of Islam, the original nation of Islam, became Sunni Muslims, right? So you're quite right. Arguably right now, <clears throat> there could be a third or fourth generation African-American Muslims, meaning regular Sunni mainstream Muslims, who somewhere ancestrally uh, through their uh, great-grandfather, great-grandmother, have some kind of roots in the Moorish Science Temple, right? So arguably that gap has already been bridged and uh, it's quite possible that the majority of members uh, kind of, if you want to say, got integrated into regular American Islam. Right. All right. I, I think, um, you know, what is that gap, you know, to getting back to your question? Yes. I think for me, at least, you know, doing research and observing, uh, you know, Speaker's Corner, watching, you know, all of the different conversations and speaking to different people, you know, in my community from all different walks of life. Uh, the, the central thing that I see that is lacking with, with us so-called Black people is our nationality. Um, uh, and that is precisely the thing 
that Noble Dry Lee, you know, the, the founder of the organization brought back to, I mean, as well as, you know, the knowledge of Islam and, and that this is our creed. But, you know, the main point is that he uh, stressed that we are not Negroes, Blacks, or Colors. Um, and I feel that that is a very significant aspect that is missing, even from uh, brothers and sisters who may be, you know, uh, African American or, or consider themselves Black, but Sunni Muslim, is that there's still this lack of understanding of who we are um, uh, from an ancestral uh, aspect or, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to just say nationalistic aspect because I also, I've been doing some, uh, you know, studying and understanding that Islam is encouraging us to kind of, you know, do not just dismiss our nationality, but then not um, become tribalized in that way. If, am, am I understanding that correctly? And, and I also can see how that can happen with quote unquote Moorish Americans when we find out about, you know, this history of us, there's a certain ego and a pride that sometimes gets into us and we feel, ha, well, our nation is, you know, we are the, we are the, you know what I mean? We did this and we did that, mm. not understanding that, hey, this is a, you know, we're a family, you know, this is humanity and we're all in this, you know, in this one family together. And that, you know, as it says in the Quran, that Allah made us into nations and tribes so that we could understand and get to know each other, not so that we could discriminate or oppress one another. Yeah. Um, and I feel that that particular thing is like a very crucial key because even with um, Islam, even with our creed, not knowing who you are is, um, man, it's like a very big gaping hole that is missing within our people that I, I, I began to notice even more so when I started to learn and understand about nationality, you know, and then I can, I can see the different cultural nuances between people from different nations. And, you know, I can hear the accents that come and I can see how, um, you know, there's a sense of pride and a sense of um, just integrity that people have when they have their nation and the history and their ancestry. And that's something that, you know, we are just simply lacking, you know what I mean? And even if, you know, it's in, and it's as simple and as clear as if you ask a so-called black person, a so-called African-American, hey, what is your nationality? If you just ask them that question and just listen to the answer, they'll, a lot of times they may say, oh, I'm American, but American, it's a continent, you know what I mean? You're, you're in, you're in uh, Canada, so technically Canada is within the American uh, continental lands. You know, people in Brazil, that's Southern American, so they're still technically American. If you say African American, well, that is two continents. You know what I mean? That's not an actual country or nation. Um, black is an adjective. That's not even um, the proper way to identify someone. Um, colored as well. Afro-American, you know, that's connecting us to our hairstyle. That's not appropriate way to identify. So, you know, when you go through all of these different names, you start to realize that all of these names don't tie us back to any history, any ancestry, any people, any land, any culture. Um, we don't have our language. And, and most importantly, we don't have our religion. Um, and I say all of that to say that you know, this is why I have been, you know, so focused on studying this information and figuring out how we can create that unity and that bridge, because I feel that there's a, a large portion of our history um, that is in Arabic or that is with our brothers and sisters in the East and different cultures and different nations that can help fill in the gaps that we're missing as a people and can, you know, help bring us together, you know what I mean? And help uh, let us know that we're not alone out here in, in America or, you know, North America, the United States. I mean, one of the, the gaps, let's say, from, from my perspective and from the perspective of any uh, regular Muslim is that some of the terminology that both Nation of Islam and, and Moore Science Temple uh, use I'm not, I'm not trying to lump you guys together. I'm just saying there are some similarities. So sometimes I refer to Nation of Islam when it's applicable. 
And that is that both of these groups uh, use the term, the English word prophets to refer to their uh, leader, right? So in the case of uh, Moorish Science Temple, the founder, Drew Ali, noble Drew Ali, is referred to as a prophet, I think pretty consistently, like throughout the, the Moorish science uh, literature. So, I mean, that term, as you know, comes like very theologically loaded from a Muslim right. perspective. Whereas from an American perspective, to be honest with you, it doesn't come so loaded because what I mean by that is there's a lot of American churches, Christian denominations that use the term prophet very loosely, like prophet with a small P, you might say. So you'll have a lady in a skirt, some lady pastor in a skirt. She's on the stage uh, just preaching from whatever, you know, the, the book of Acts. And underneath on the television, it'll say prophet tests so and so. So now Muslims look at that in a particular way. Like we, we would say, is she claiming to be like Moses and like Jesus and prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them. And is she claiming to have received some direct revelation, scripture, speech of God directly from the divine source? And if we don't follow her and we don't acknowledge her as a prophetess, we uh, therefore become disbelievers who are headed for hell. And all. But in all fairness now, if you ask this prophetess lady, right, that I'm using in this example, is that the case? She'd say, no, it just, it just means I'm feeling moved by the Holy Spirit and I've been guided by the Holy Spirit and the workings of our church to be the one who's up here to be preaching to the rest of you. And, and, and it's just the first amongst equals kind of thing, you know? So my point is that the English word prophet, especially with a small p, has become quite diluted in American theological circles, especially some Christian theological circles. But from the perspective of Muslims, it means exactly what I explained. Like it's someone who, this is a surprise for you. Is that okay? Um, <laughs> it's you asked for, yeah, you asked for Anand Rashid. So um, yeah. I actually asked him, Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam, brother Anand, how are you? Assalamualaikum. Sorry, I'm joining you for a few. Yeah, uh, I'm joining you for a few minutes. My phone's battery is very low, so. Alhamdulillah. I so just I'll just to you. update the both of you, um, basically, brother Rami had put a video out there saying that he, he was giving a message for Adnan Rashid, and he wanted to ask one or two questions specifically to you, brother Adnan. So, so I invited you, Rami. I didn't tell you because I I thought there's a one percent chance brother Adnan will show up. I can never catch this guy. I'm surprised. Sometimes he responds to his emails. Sometimes he doesn't. Mashallah, he's here. And I'm very you, bad with my emails. On one more thing, brother Adnan, I haven't joined the Moorish Science Temple yet. I'm just, you know, I'm just wearing it for camaraderie, brotherly spirit. So since you're here for just a few minutes, I'll, 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 I'll let you take over and you guys can just talk. For, uh, yeah. Hello, uh, doing, hi, Rami. I'm doing, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing good. We, have, I'm we have a bit of feedback, a little bit of feedback. Uh, is it from me? I'm, I'm sitting in a very noisy cafe. I'm sorry about this. Uh, don't, yeah, and, don't worry about and, it. Yeah. So uh, I watched your video um, a while back, actually a, a very, very long time ago, uh, nearly two years ago. And then I thought, okay, uh, I didn't know what your questions were. I can't actually remember. It was a while back. And Brother Sadat yeah. mentioned you and he requested that I must join. And I wasn't too sure if I'll be able to join. But now here I am a few minutes. Go ahead, inshallah. How, how are Allah. you? Very, I'm, very uh, good to see you. Indeed, indeed. Um, I'm, 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 I'm well. I'm well. I'll say that. Um, this is a pleasant surprise. I appreciate it. Um, I didn't have, I don't have the questions that I had in particular for you. I, I think at that time I was just really trying to seek out um, sincere brothers and uh, Muslim brothers who were really interested in teaching, you know what I mean? And not into the entertaining, just trying to prove a point or, you know what I mean? That whole thing. Um, but what I, what the question I did have written down, I mean, for both of you, but since you're here, Nan, is, yeah. is there any books, scholars, or texts you could recommend that really elaborates on Muslims being called Moors or Moors being called uh, Muslims, the synonymousness? Uh, when I look into history, uh, particularly the golden age of Islam, you know, Moors are referred to as Muslims and then also, you know, sometimes Muslims are referred to as Moors in this okay. synonymous way. 
Okay, you see, uh, very quickly before my phone dies because my battery is getting uh, my battery my battery is getting very low. So, um, with regards to the term Moors, you see, this term was actually mainly used by the Europeans to refer to uh, the the Arabs of Al Andalus. Um, and this term wasn't actually used by the Muslim or the Arabs for themselves. It was not a self-reflection of the Arabs. Okay, it was some, something projected uh, onto them by the Europeans. So that's why when you look at you you look at medieval European sources, they uh, they they use the term moros, moros okay. or. Uh -oh. I think you might have been gone there. Yeah. The battery may have died, but, <laughs> yeah. but in that, to be honest with you, in that one minute, in that. Guys, sorry, I think I lost you there. So, yeah. uh, am I back? The term. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, the term more, more or moros was used by the Europeans rather than the Arabs or the North Africans who were with the Arabs at the time. Uh, so, there were two types of Muslims uh, in Al Andalus, in Spain. Uh, one were one type were the Arabs, and the other type uh, were the Berbers, uh, North Africans, right? Okay. So collectively, uh, they made uh, the Andalusian civilization collectively, and the Europeans refer to them as Moors. And if you look at one of the the greatest shrines of the Christians or Catholics in northern Spain, uh, which is uh, uh, I think uh, Santiago de Compostela. I don't know if you've heard of it, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, they believe that St. James is buried there and they have given him a name, uh, Metamoros. Okay, St. James Metamoros, yeah, okay. which means the killer of the Moors, right? right yeah, yeah, so yeah. this shows that the Europeans uh, in general and in particular Spanish chroniclers and authors and writers and historians were using this term to describe uh, the Arabs, just like the Crusaders and uh, Europeans at the time of the Crusades were using the term Saracen to describe right. okay. all Muslims yeah. uh, or the Arabs. I mean, they had two terms to describe the Muslims. One was the Turks. The other one, uh, the other one, uh, the other one uh, was uh, Saracens. So Moors right. is not a term used by Muslims or the Berbers for themselves. Rather, it was a term imposed upon them. Uh, and later historians and history writing started to use this term loosely for Muslim Spain. Even to this day, there's a book titled Moorish Spain. Moorish Spain, authored by Richard Fletcher, Richard Fletcher, who is an English historian, and even he uses this term, even though it's, it's, it's a bit anachronistic to use it, uh, in this day and age. So um, this is all I have to say on that topic for now, uh, b without being prepared. I wasn't but, uh, prepared to, no, but, but yeah. that is quite helpful and that's quite revealing because what it says to me, this is how I'm interpreting it, tell me if I'm on the right track, which is that... Yeah. Those African Americans, oh, you have that book, Richard Fletcher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah those, Moorish Spain. Those African Americans who believe themselves to be the descendants of the Moorish Muslims, right? If they, if they reject the term Black American because they think this has been imposed on them by Europeans, if they yeah. reject the term Negro or Afro American yeah. because they feel these terms have been imposed on them by Europeans. They yeah. should similarly, tell me if I'm correct here, they should similarly reject the term more as well, because this term as well is not something that they created for themselves, but Agreed. something that the conquistadors and the Spanish inquisitors used against them. Is that right? Agreed. Agreed. And before that, actually, the term Moors was used before that. And, uh, and the term Moors is actually quite ancient. Uh, it was used by Christian authors even before Islam, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, it, it is an ancient term which was applied to the Muslims in Spain uh, loosely. And uh, I believe this term is actually originally European as a reference to the Arabs. Uh, Muslims never use this term for themselves. Uh, neither Arabs nor the Berbers, to my knowledge, use this term to describe themselves in Spain. And, and with regards to West Africans who were taken across the Atlantic, uh, the ancestors of the current Afro-American population, uh, they were also from diverse nations and tribes. Uh, there were Fulanis there, uh, uh, predominantly there were uh, Mandingos, 
uh, from current day Nigeria and uh, much of West Africa. There were Senegalese Muslims. Uh, so th that history is very vast. I would strongly recommend a book um, on that particular topic. And it is by Sylviane Idioff. It is titled Servants of Allah. Servants of Allah, very powerful book, very, very important book on this topic as to the history of uh, um, Africans in America who were Muslims. Okay, Ustad. about 30%, 30% were Muslims, yeah. Ustad, could you clarify on that point though, that mm. if, if the uh, historical ancestral link between modern African Americans and the so-called Moors, now we should say the so-called Moors of Spain, if that link yeah. were to be severed, if as mm. you said, if it were the case, which is what I always thought, that mm. the majority of African Americans are not of Moorish descent, but they came from countries that today are Senegal and Mali and uh, Niger and various, various uh, uh, nations, different tribes. And yeah, so almost, almost all uh, the West African coastal regions yeah. and, and beyond, and beyond, yeah. even within, within the mainland, yes. But the point yes. that I'd like to clarify is that because in Islam, Religion is not tied to ethnicity or to tribe. So it would make no difference. For example, I mean, if, if, the, if a particular African-American were descended from the, the Fulani tribe, th this makes no difference to us as Muslims, does it? Anyone can be a Muslim Correct. and you don't have to be historically descended from this civilization or that civilization in order to, to be right with God, to be on the right path. Correct. I agree. And this is how those people looked at things when they were together in ships, loaded onto slave ships, take, to, being taken across the Atlantic. They came from different backgrounds, from different uh, statuses. Uh, some were scholars, some were princes, others were peasants, uh, some were hunter-gatherers. So, and, and one thing they shared was, apart from the uh, uh, African geography, one thing they shared was Islam. And in some cases, they even spoke different languages. So they, they communicated in different ways. And a, a lot of these details are put down by Sylviane Dioff in her book, in, in her fascinating book, which is a must read uh, for anyone who's interested in this topic, Servants of Allah. She specifically deals with the Muslim case. Uh, uh, she thinks, or she claims, nearly 30%, 20-30% people who were taken across the Atlantic uh, 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 were Muslim slaves, yeah, and this capital, yeah, yeah. So bring a lot of things to light. You know, when it comes to identity and how diverse it was in the case of uh, Afro Americans, I mean now Afro Americans, but previously before they were taken uh, to the Atlantic, uh, sorry, across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, what identities they come, did they come from? Uh, what languages did they speak? What versions of Islam were they following? A lot of these questions are addressed in her book. Uh, and it's a must read anyone interested in this topic. So, so this question of Moors or being Moorish is, uh, is, is a very interesting one. And uh, I have no doubt that it was used by the Europeans to describe uh, the Arabs and the Berbers from Islamic Spain. Yeah. And this dark skinned, uh, you know, this classic. Yeah, go on. Well, yeah. well, I mean, I remember that, uh, Brother Rami, this is one of the questions that I think you wanted to bring up with me, and I wanted to pass it on to uh, Ustad Adnan. Um, you were bringing up um, the uh, Quran, chapter 33, verse 40, where it says that Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah, and he is the seal of the prophets. Um, so, uh, Ustad Adnan... What is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? Because that verse didn't say he's the last of the messengers, right? So is there a door open here for, for someone like Noble Drew Ali or Elijah Muhammad or Mirza Ghulam Ahmed or anyone else to come and, and, and say that they have the title of uh, prophet yeah, there or is. the title of messenger? There is no possibility for another prophet after Prophet Muhammad. Uh, whether a messenger or a prophet. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad was a messenger. Every messenger is a prophet, but not every prophet is a messenger as we are taught in Islam, Islamically speaking. So it is very clear in the Quran that he is the last of the prophets. Khatamun Nabiyin means the seal of the prophets. That means there is no, uh, no other prophet coming after him. And from his own teachings, 
uh, from my own teachings, we have statements like La Nabi Abadi. There is no prophet after me. Full stop. Period. And he used the term Nabi. Okay. And even the Quran uses the term Nabi. If there's no Nabi after him, a messenger is out of the question. Because uh, every messenger is a prophet, a Nabi. Uh, and not every Nabi is a messenger. So Nabi, the position of Nabi is relatively uh, slighter than a messenger. So if someone cannot be a prophet, let alone a messenger, I mean, uh, after the prophet of Islam, then there is no room for another prophet. So um, that's it. It's very, very clear. It's categorically stated in the Quran. And it is categorically taught by the prophet himself that there is no prophet coming after me. None. Even when Jesus returns, he will not return in his prophetic uh, capacity. He will only return. He will only return as a follower. And this this much is very clear from the very report that uh, when Jesus will descend in Damascus, the Imam will step back for him to lead, and Jesus will push him forward to signify, to highlight his status that he is not here as a prophet, rather he is here as a follower of the law of Muhammad, the last messenger of God. As far as he was concerned, he had done his job. Uh, his ministry was done. And when he, when he was raised alive by Allah, uh, his ministry was done by that time. So this is what we are taught in Islam. And Islamically speaking, in the Quran, in the prophetic tradition, it's very clear. There's no prophet after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I think you had a question, Rami. Yeah, well, uh, a few. But yeah, before and, and, I... And, Okay. In my phone, my phone might die any moment, so please go ahead. Okay, well, real quick, uh, just to get this, uh, if you hadn't heard of this book, A Muslim American Slave, The Life of Omar Ibn Said, have you guys yes, heard of that? Yes, amazing book. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> okay, uh, amazing book. Put, yeah. that, that, um, Omar Ibn Said is one, then uh, uh, there is another slave who has been uh, addressed by academics. His name was Job Ben Solomon. Job Ben Solomon. Okay. Uh, his Ar African name is Ayuba uh, Diallo. Diallo is a is a is a, is a, a, a I'm I'm assuming it's a it's a tribal name in West Africa in current day Senegal. So his name was Ayub bin Suleiman, or in English Job Ben Solomon. He has also been uh, addressed by academics. There is a book titled Fortunate Slave, Fortunate Slave, published by the Oxford University Press. Uh, yeah, that's another Thank book you. you need to look into. Omar bin, Sa Omar bin Said's case is absolutely fascinating as well. Amazing, yeah. amazing case. Uh, and, uh, and all of these people are, by, by the way, briefly addressed by Sylviane Idioff in her book, Servants of Allah. So you can get many more references in that book and you can explore further. I think we'll on do. that note, guys, I will, take, I will take your leave because my phone might die any second. So before it dies, I'll, I would like to leave one positive cordial terms <laughs> inshallah that was very thank helpful you. jazakallah khair thank you thank you so much very helpful thank you very much my pleasure thank my pleasure thank you so much assalamu alaikum thank you assalamu alaikum thank you assalamu alaikum um uh well just just continuing um from because we have spoke about and this is uh, thank you for that man i really appreciate that that that's um it's really um i really appreciate that yeah, yeah. um but uh, you had spoke right before and I got on about the loose uh, usage of the, the term prophet. And that is something that, um, you know, through our studies that has really helped me to understand things better that, you know, it teaches us the man knows nothing by being told. You know, if you're just told something, but you don't investigate it for yourself and look for yourself to do the studies, you just believe in what someone tells you, but you don't truly know. And so, you know, I started looking, well, what does a prophet mean? And in our, you know, in the English language, just real quick, it's, you know, it says a person regarded as inspired teacher or proclaimer of the will of God. Um, so to, to your point, you know, the English definition of prophet uh, opens it up to make it applicable. And in, and in other dictionaries, it even just says, you know, the person who uh, is the founder of a religious organization. So it, it, it makes it, you know, completely opened up in that sense to where if you open up a church and, you know, what I mean, then you can say you were inspired by God and you're a prophet. Um, but to that point, I wanted to bring it to the term seal um, in in uh, in the Quran. And I was wondering uh, if if you know or if you could ask other Muslims, 
is the term that is used sealed in Surah 3340 used uh, in other places in the Quran? Do you know of? Um, it's Khatim, Khatim on Nabiin. Khatim is what's used as a seal. So um, I'd have and, to look that up. I mean, that would have been a good, great question for us. Yeah, 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 that would have been a great question for Khatim, yeah. And, but and, Khatim, again, um, it's, see, Muslim scholars and linguists, they don't only use, um, they don't only look at how that word is used in the Quran, uh, but linguistically, there, 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 there need not be any other, uh, uh, the Quran need not be the limit. So in other words, how did the Prophet, peace be upon him, use that term in the Hadith literature, right? right okay, Muslim yeah. scholars even look towards non-Muslim poetry, Arabic poetry at the same time, around the time of the Quran and before the Quran which is called the poetry of Jahiliya, the time of Jahiliya, the time of the pre-Islamic ignorance. But gotcha. they were masters of language. They knew how to use Arabic words. So Muslim scholars even look towards that genre of non-Muslim poetry, Arabic poetry, to see how were those words used and understood. The words that are in the Quran, how were they used and understood at that time? So my point being that um, like these meanings are not just pulled out of thin air. There's a reason why the majority of Muslim scholars throughout, you know, 1400 years of Islamic history have always unanimously understood Khatimun Nabiin, seal of the prophets to mean not what Mirza Ghulam Ahmad or Nation of Islam kind of brought in in the, in the 20th century, early 20th century. But well, it's an approving seal. But no, it, it's a seal that closes. It, it seals everything. So for example, in the old days before email, you had snail mail. And my mom actually used to, you know, there was this folding paper, like she, you'd fold it in a particular way, the letter, the letter. Gotcha. And, and then, you, then you put a seal on it. And like, once you put that seal, that means nothing else is going in. Nothing else is coming out. Everything that needed to be said has been said. It's ready to be dropped in the mailbox now. So, so also, if you look at the context, right? If it meant an approving seal, or an authenticating seal, what would be the purpose of the language that God uses immediately before it, which is that Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. So I think the Sunni Muslim understanding of that makes a lot of sense because in the history of prophets, in the history of prophethood, in the history of Israel, many sons inherited prophethood from their fathers. Mm. Uh, it, meaning that God made not only Abraham a prophet, but then God made his son Ishmael a prophet too. God made Abraham's son uh, Isaac a prophet too. And then right. God makes Isaac's son Jacob a prophet too. So had the prophet Muhammad had uh, sons who lived to become grown men, um, it would have made sense in, in terms of the history of revelation and the history of prophethood that maybe now one of these men Prophet Muhammad's sons is going to be the next prophet. I so when that when that ayah when that verse says he's not the father of any of your men, but he's the he's the seal of the prophets. You look at that contextually and it makes sense, meaning that he is the last. There's no one after him, you know. And by the way, on a side note, that verse is very interesting because the prophet didn't have any sons who would live to become men. So that that Ooh. verse was proven to be true because you know. In, 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 in a, I mean, in, in Arabia, in, in the pre-modern world, you don't stop having sons, even into your 60s, 70s, 80s, right? As we know from the Bible, mm. you don't stop having sons and daughters. Right. So at that time, there's no way that the prophet, peace be upon him, could have known that he's going to die at age 62 or 63. And none of his uh, 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 sons are going to outlive him and grow to become men. So that verse also is a sign of the divine origin of the Quran. Gotcha. You know, that, and see, and, you know, respectfully, that is something I, I have to do more studying on to really, I, and I need to, um, I want, that was one of the questions is that I, I was wondering about the hadiths um, that speak or that support um, Prophet Muhammad being the seal or the, the final uh, messenger, the final prophet, um, just to get a better uh, a better understanding. Because I, you know, in asking these questions, I realize that it can come off 
uh, like it's someone trying to find holes to poke, you know, from watching the speaker's corner. I it's see okay. it as, okay. you know what I mean? Um, but, but my intention is, is, is not about like trying to find, oh, well, how can we make this work? But really, you know, sincerely trying to understand, okay, this is what the Quran says. This is what Prophet Muhammad, you know, peace be upon him, is what it says. So, um, Let's understand what's going on. You know, maybe there's a mistake on our part. Um, and that's, you know, in part where, you know, I've been appealing and, and, and reaching out to quote unquote Orthodox uh, Muslim or Sunni Muslims or just, uh, you know, Muslims from the East, I, I try to say. Um, but in that, um, like I, I study, I study some of the things that Noble Draw Lee brought us and I'm, and I'm looking like we have, I don't even want to com compare it per se to hadith, but we have what is called the oral statements and prophecies. Um, you know, it's like a very small packet of statements that are attributed uh, to Noble Drali. And it'll say, Sister, you know, Beth uh, Bay from Temple 24 said that the prophet said, and, you know, such and such from Temple here said. And so it's like, wow, okay, I, I see that. But then when I started to study, you know, what the hadiths are and understanding the the science and the structure behind it, it's like, OK, well, this doesn't compare to the hadiths. You know, um, when I when I look at the, you know, the the Quran or the the book that Noble Jali brought to us and I studied that inside and out, you know, I don't, I, didn't, I don't know if I said this before, but the Quran, uh, Circle 7, the book that Noble Dra'ali brought, not the Quran from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, that booklet is only, or the main part of that is the 18 missing years of Jesus's life, uh, peace be upon him, that's not in the Bible. Mm. Um, so, so you, you guys know, believe that Jesus went to India, is that right? Correct. Okay. Is that, do, do you, is that uh, something that uh, Muslims do not believe? or have a conflicting reports about? Well, well in, in the Muslim world, the, the, the only one who tried to like popularize this idea was a man named Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who you can look up. He's, he's the founder of the Ahmadiyya or Qadiani group. Okay. Yeah, okay. you call them Qadianis, they call themselves Ahmadi uh, or Ahmadiyya. And they believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was a prophet and he was kind of the spiritually reincarnated Jesus who came to Punjab, India uh, in the early, uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So anyhow, he, he, he tried to popularize this idea and his group accepts this belief that Jesus escaped the cross and he went to India and he lived out a full life in India and he died and he's buried there. But again, ironically, and a lot of Ahmadis don't know this, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad did not originate even this belief. This belief was first put forward by some Western Orientalists. So there were German Orientalists. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. Th there were British Orientalists who had already put out this kind of um, marginal kind of hypothesis, idea, thesis that, you know, maybe Jesus escaped and he went to India. And some of the Hindu scriptures talk about someone that kind of sounds like someone dressed in white and he had a beard and he came from uh, the, the, the West. And so that could be uh, Jesus. But... Um, so, but to answer your question, this is this is not what Sunni Muslims believe. Yes, Sunni Muslims believe that God rescued Jesus, uh, lifted him into the heavens, and He will return him near the last days. But to yeah. be honest with you, I mean, um, there's probably bigger, you know, theological issues that need to be sorted out and and sifted out first. And and I think like our conversation so far has been helpful because um, I think I understood you. And I think you understood me like when I was explaining that the language of a uh, prophet for a noble Jew, Ali, th this is a theological stumbling point for most Muslims. And while I am sympathetic and I understand how you're using the word prophet in a more generic kind of way, um, the fact is there's one billion Muslims out there that need to be convinced. So my philosophy has always been that the purpose of language is to communicate to facilitate communication. So if a word in, in the language is actually not facilitating communication, but it's actually becoming a stumbling block now, 
it's actually becoming a problem between you and me coming together. If I can do away with that word without doing away with the concept, why don't I just do away with that word, right? So, I mean, you seem easy going about it, but if you were seriously offended uh, about being referred to as African-American or me using that term at all, at some point I would just drop it completely and say, okay, just like, what do you want me to say? We're talking about people with dark skin in America, right? I got you. Okay, I I'll got throw you. that word out if that makes you happy, my brother. You see what I'm saying? Um, just like son of God, right? Like there's a lot of nominal Christians now, you follow EF Dawa, so you're familiar with these conversations, I'm sure. Mm. There's a lot of nominal Christians who don't really believe Jesus is divine or that he's the divine son of God, part of the Trinity. But they still say, oh, he was just the son of God. And now you ask some of these nominal Christians, what do you mean by son of God? Did God have a son? Did God have a wife? Did this son always exist? What do you mean? And they'll say that, no, son of God just means he's a holy person. He's a good person. Um so then I say to them, okay, then, then just drop that term, right? If that's all you mean, just say good person. Then just say righteous person, right? So it's not going to work that a Christian becomes Muslim and in the mosque, he's still referring to Jesus as the son of God, right? I'm going to say, brother, listen, what you mean and what they understand, it's completely different. So just, it's best to just, you know, drop that language altogether, right? So this is not to coerce or pressure you. This is just to actually... Uh, maybe this might be of benefit to other Moors who are listening, right? That these terms, and I noticed even in uh, the Noble Drew Ali Quran, and just to clarify to the audience, so to, to further add to the confusion, right? Uh, the Moorish Science <laughs> Temple has a book, has a small book or booklet, which they also call the Quran with a K, the Quran. Um, but they are not, they are not claiming that this is the Quran that Prophet Muhammad preached and recited and that Muslims are supposed to be following. There is just any way some. Yeah, this is some additional yeah. uh, writing by Noble Drew Ali. But maybe I can pause and ask you that again, the purpose of language is to facilitate communication and understanding, not to create confusion. So um, why? Like, why? Why did he call it um, the Quran? Question. I mean, why not just call it? anything else <laughs> I, I think about that a lot and um man i was just listening to a brother and they were speaking about um uh, i believe it was brother muhammad ali um uh, not the boxer but the kind of speaker corner okay, okay um and it was speaking he's about, a boxer too huh? yeah <laughs> oh. <laughs> no i mean intellectual boxer but yeah one. Got you, true very true yeah. uh but that um that you can't take our current understanding, I think it was, it was speaking about uh, the age of marriage or, you know, that kind of issue. And you can't take our current understanding now in society and apply it back then, um, you know, because times were different in the customs and the culture, et cetera. So I think about that in, in respect to so-called Black people back in that time, in that time frame. And, you know, now there's so much more information available and there's been so many more um, leaders and just uh, people that have come to give our people information. But at that time, you know, our education and access to information was extremely limited. And many of us were completely wrapped up in the church. You know, our, my answer is not to say, but my people were wrapped up in the church so much, you know, um, so much so that I feel they were not even able to entertain an idea of a Quran, of this thing called Islam, of Allah, you know, this, all, this entire concept was, I feel was, you know, basically foreign, completely foreign to our people. And, and that's kind of what I was alluding to when I was saying um, that what he brought to us, the information was kind of a bridge um, in the sense that the book is called the Quran, right? Um, which, okay, now it's connecting us to Islam and Muslims. It also speaks, you know, the first, when you open the page, know thyself and know uh, your father God, Allah. I know thyself and know and Allah. You know, that's, so that's the first thing on the inside cover. So now you're bringing in Allah. But the central, um, the central part of the book is about Jesus. So now it, I feel like it reels the people in. And it's like, okay, well, you know, and it even says this book is for all of, uh, let me read it just to be uh, precise. 
uh, dear, uh, dear readers, um, these secret lessons are for all of those who love Jesus and desire to know about his life works and teachings. And so I felt like that was the way for him to extend that olive branch and say, well, you know, you love Jesus, don't you? Well, let's learn about Jesus. And then as you learn, you see Jesus mentioned a lot and you see, you know, it speak about not worshiping the son or, you know, only, uh, only giving praise and thanksgiving and adoration to Allah that Allah is the, the most supreme, beneficent, um, you know. So I feel like it, it brings a lot of our people in and then does away with the misunderstandings that Jesus was also God or a part of the Trinity and, and all of that aspect. So I, I but that's just my belief. I, I wish I knew more, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, I am also actively seeking to, to to learn from the elders of this movement. Unfortunately, um, due to, uh, you know, corruption and just people doing things that they shouldn't do with this movement, there's been a lot of stagnation and a lot of people that have kind of uh, went underground or, um, you know, just kind of like disappear from the scene. So there's no one that is really in an elder position that is, teaching about this movement from a historical factual perspective um so it's kind of hard to to get some of the information or understanding on well why was this said and why was this done and what happened and with you know in regards to this and, and that so um that's the best answer i can come up with and and that's a great answer and i'm i'm, I'm just reflecting on my own thoughts even as i'm listening to you and i just feel that for that bridge to be uh, for that for that gap to be bridged rather <clears throat> it would take some effort on both sides. So it would take effort on the mainstream Muslim side to, um, like for example, for example, when you talk about um, Jesus going to India in Noble Jew Ali's Quran, um, it, it, it would take a certain effort from both sides to say that, Maybe that's not the final message written in stone. Maybe there's some deeper, profound, figurative message in that, or there's some kind of symbolical message in that. So it, it, would, it would require mainstream Muslims to have a sympathetic kind of view towards the Moorish organization, but it would also require of Moors to perhaps take a slightly more symbolic interpretation. So I'll give you an example. What I mean there is, Obviously, one billion Muslims are not going to modify their views on Jesus to that of more science temple and say, okay, then Jesus died in India, he's buried somewhere there. But what we could do is both of us could perhaps um, uh, perhaps uh, say that maybe the deeper message or the medicine that Noble Drew Ali was trying to give to Black Americans is that if you really want the truth about Jesus, you're going to have to look not to the West, but you're gonna to have to look to the east. You see, you see what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I'm near, I, I mean, I might be completely wrong on that. I'm just trying to take a sympathetic view here from from a Muslim perspective, and Indeed. say that okay, it's not necessarily that Noble Drew Ali was trying to teach um, a view that we would deem to be heterodox or even heretical or something. It could be that this was the medicine that was required at the time. So, and I take this from the page of Imam Worth Din Muhammad's. Sunni Muslim community, because this is what they've done with Elijah Muhammad. So they haven't rejected Elijah Muhammad in the way that Malcolm X rejected Elijah Muhammad, but they've kind of reinterpreted his legacy and seen him as a bridge that connects to mainstream Islam. They've done that with Master Fard Muhammad too. So I'm sure you're familiar, Brother Rami, that the only photograph that Nation of Islam admits is a photograph of Master Fard Muhammad is the one where he's holding the Quran. Right. Um, and Imam Worth Din Muhammad, rightly or wrongly, but very effectively, he reinterpreted the whole meaning of that photo to help guide his community to Sunni Islam. Because there's so much debate over Master Fard Muhammad. Originally, Nation of Islam believed he's God in the flesh, right? He's God on earth. Right, um, right. And today, it's mixed up. There's some Nation of Islam members who still believe that. There's others who say, no, no, no. He was just, a God was working through Master Fard Muhammad. That's what we mean. But... Um, what, what, what 
Imam Warithuddin Muhammad, and by the way, everyone, this is the son of Elijah Muhammad, who became an Orthodox Muslim and guided the majority of Nation of Islam members to Sunni Islam. He said, look at that photograph of Master Farid Muhammad looking at, at the Quran. What is he really trying to tell you through this photograph? He's trying to say, never mind what I said. Never mind what you think I said about mathematics. Never mind what you think I said or didn't say about white people. Never mind what you think I claimed about myself or I didn't claim about myself. This book that I'm holding, I submit to this book. And I want you to go to this book for the ultimate answers. This is going to guide you to the fullness of, of the truth, right? So, so maybe I'm just wrongly superimposing that on, on Noble Drew Ali. But from my Muslim perspective, that's the best that I can do. Like, that's my, my sympathetic way of looking at it and saying, okay, when he's talking about Jesus in India... Does he really think this is important for black people in America to believe? Is it really important for black people's betterment to believe that the physical Jesus is buried in Kashmir in India? I don't think so. But it is important for the black American who had Christianity uh, forced on him in many instances to understand that, look, you don't want to se sever Jesus. You don't want to cut Jesus completely off. But if you want the true Jesus, you're going to have to look somewhere else to get that picture. You see what I'm saying? Indeed. Sorry to Indeed. make that long. No, I, I, um, I completely agree. I, I understand that perspective. And I, I feel very much like I was, I was looking. So this is, uh, we have a book called The Quran Questions for uh, Moorish Americans, which is basically like, a, you know, it's just like a, a, a straight question and answer kind of pamphlet. Um, with, you know, just like some basic questions, you know, who made you, Allah, can we see him, you know, where's the closest place that we can reach him, um, different things like that, just to get us to understand it. But on the back, it has um, a, a legal document, for the, the paperwork that they filed for the organization. Um, and on here, it says, uh, the more science temple of America deriving its power and authority from the great Quran of Muhammad to propagate the faith and extend the learning and truth uh, of the great prophet uh, in America to appoint um, and consecrate missionaries of the prophet and to establish the faith of Muhammad in America. Uh, you know, you know, mind you, at that time they were using Muhammadan religion, just, you know, just to uh, clarify. But I'm sorry. No, no, please, 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 please. Um, so I, I was going to say that it's, it's things like that. Um, uh, 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 speaking about Jesus going to the East, you know, for me, when I, you know, and I, forgive me, I didn't even mention this beforehand, but I grew up unique in that uh, my parents didn't force religion on my sister and I. Um, they were forced in the church eight days a week, at the whole nine, but um, they taught us God is real. You know, I mean, you're supposed to do good uh, instead of, you know, bad. You know, if you want to go to church, we can go there. If you want to look into something else, we can do that as well. But mainly just know that God is real, you know, and do do what's right in life um, and allowed us to kind of learn and, and seek the information on our own. And so when I came to the noble Juali, the information that he brought to me, it really helped plug in some of the missing pieces and just get a better understanding of like, the Jesus story that, you know, I get when I was growing up listening to Christians and, and church just didn't quite make sense. Um, but then when I learned about, OK, well, it's saying that Jesus actually was traveling in Africa and in, in India and studying and learning. I said, well, that that makes a lot more sense, you know, and then, uh, you know, that began me. I, I began to look into the east and then, you know, I. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Malcolm X's grandson, uh, who was named Malcolm Shabazz, who ended up getting pa he passed away or was killed, rather, um, he started to kind of teach me some things. Um, and just uh, I, I was watching one of his interviews, and he mentioned that uh, Isa, you know, Jesus, is mentioned more times in the Quran in the Quran than Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon. I said, well, I said, well, I said, wait a minute. I said that's. I've never heard that before, you know, and then it just spawned me in, uh, it just, it, it made me look deeper into the Quran and the Islam and realizing, oh, okay, these people are documented in this Quran also. So it's not, now it's not an idea on 
is Jesus a real person? But now let's just get to the real story of Jesus or Issa. Um, and so I feel like, you know, a lot of the information that Noble Dry Lee brought us is really introduced, you know, even in the sense that this Quran that we have is just, you know, it's a pamphlet essentially, it's 64, it's very small. Um, it's nothing compared to the Quran uh, by way of Prophet Muhammad and then also the Hadith that you're supposed to study with that. Um, and so I just feel like many of the things that are taught just kind of open the door, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, almost training wheels, if you will, or, you know what I mean? Like the introductory course or, you know, your bachelor's degree, you know, if you go, you get your master's and your PhD, but that's when we go to the East and we, we study with, you know, the real scholars, if you will. But um, like even the, the chapter, I don't know if you looked into it, but the chapter religion from uh, uh, the Quran, Circle 7 and Noble Dry Lee brought us, um, you know, this, and to your point about building the bridge and having um, just some understanding between us, this is kind of the thing that when I read this over and thought about it, I said, if anything, we should lead with this. It's coming from the Moorish perspective in terms of asking for help or um, seeking understanding from Muslims. And it says, there is but one Allah, the author, the creator, the governor of the world, almighty, eternal, and incomprehensible. The sun is not Allah, though his noblest image. He enlightened the world with his brightness. His warmth giveth life to the products of the earth. Admire him as the creature, the instrument of Allah, but worship him not. To the one who is supreme, most wise, and beneficent. And to him alone belong worship, adoration, thanksgiving, and praise. And so those are the first three lines of the chapter that we have on religion. Um, and when I read that, you know, and just from my studies and listening to, to different Muslims um, speak, I feel like a lot of that comes from or is also mentioned in the Quran um, in the sense of just understanding about um, some aspects of Allah. But that the Quran uh, really gives us a full understand or as full as we can understand Allah. Um, you know, so this is just like an example of the introductory uh, aspect to Allah, but we have to um, still study the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad so much so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been studying this booklet a lot. And the very last line of the book says, we honor all the true and divine prophets. And I found when I was reading and just reflecting on that, I found that to be extremely significant one to your point about the term prophet and how it's used here in the West and the United States, and it's very loose. And in, in, in the book, it put the qualifier true and divine prophet. So now it's not just anyone that claims to be a prophet, we honor them, but they have to be true and divine, you know. And, and, and with that, I, you know, to honor true and divine prophets, you have to know what they did, what they were about, because how could you honor these people if you don't know anything about them? And thus, it forces us to learn about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it forces us to study the Quran and the Hadiths and to really get an understanding of what a true and divine prophet is. Another one of those signposts that I noticed um, was towards the end of uh, Noble Drew Ali Quran or Circle 7 Quran. And I found that very interesting. It said, the Turks, the Turks are the true descendants of Hagar, who are the chief protectors of the Islamic creed of Mecca. So, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining if you wrote this in the 1920s, um, you know, the, 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 the last Ottoman Sultan was still there in power in Turkey. Even if he wasn't, even after the uh, caliphate was abolished, Turkey still remains a Sunni Muslim country. So if the Turks are the protectors of the Islamic creed of Mecca, the question is, what Islam are they upon, right? They're not upon the nation of Islam theology. They're not um, following the Moorish Science Temple organization, obviously. They're, they're not Shia Muslims. I mean, they are just Orthodox 
mainstream Sunni Muslims, right? So this could be another one of those signposts that perhaps Noble Drew Ali wanted to leave there. He wanted to plant that in the ground so that people would look towards that, you know, for the fullness of the, uh, the, the Islamic faith. Um, but at this point, let, let, let me share a little bit of tough love with you. You know, there's love and then there's tough love. So I'm going to give uh, a little bit of tough love here, right? I, I, I do try very much to be sympathetic. Believe me, I try to understand where people are coming from and even where movements are coming from. And I get it. I understand it. I've seen even second generation Muslim youth, children of Muslim immigrants from the Muslim world who have come to America, who have come to Canada, who so easily lose their way. In, in the wilderness of North America, as the Nation of Islam puts it. Mm. They go, some have gone astray so quickly. So I can understand the challenges of a community that has been enslaved, that has been dispossessed, uh, kidnapped, um, in, in many cases forcibly Christianized, forcibly baptized, to expect them all now to understand instantaneously, understand the fullness of orthodoxy and to follow everything overnight. That's a very big ask. Like uh, that's a big, big ask. That's a big demand. Even on an individual level, we change slowly, right? I was born into a Muslim family. I was raised as a Muslim, uh, but I didn't pray regularly until age 26. It took me time to evolve and to change. And I'm still evolving and I'm still growing and I'm still trying to learn. So this is an ongoing process. So my point is I'm sympathetic when I hear some members from the Moorish Science Temple or Nation of Islam saying, we need time to understand. We're on that journey. We haven't learned Arabic yet. Um, we, 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 you know, we're evolving. We're but here's the tough love that's coming, right? The tough love is my brother, that in the hundred years or so that the Moorish Science Temple has existed, in the 70, uh, no, in the, in the 80 years, uh, maybe 90 years that Nation of Islam has existed. There are so many people who have converted to Islam. They've become uh, Muslim and they've learned the five daily prayers and they've memorized the Quran and they've become scholars of Islam, right? So I understand everyone needs some time, but at the same time, um, like even in the past year, even, the, even in the past two years, I, I can introduce you to people who became Muslim two years ago, three years ago, and now they know how to do the Orthodox prayers. They do the five daily prayers. They know how to recite the Quran. They're not Arabic experts, neither am I, but they know how to recite the Quran. They fast during Ramadan. They've, they've evolved past December. Right? It's not just mm. fasting in December, October. No, we'll, we'll do it with everybody else. We've got Muslim co-workers at work. We've got fellow Muslim classmates, they're fasting, I can do it too. So the question, my brother, is when, right? Like, there seems to be a recognition amongst many, I haven't spoken to more Science Temple people, to be quite honest, but I've spoken to a number of Nation of Islam people. And generally, there seems to be a recognition that, yeah, no, you're right, we should be doing the five daily prayers. Elijah Muhammad did teach about the five prayers, but then the question is when, right? That Savior's Day, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to share this. Some people might not like it, but some of our friends from Nation of Islam might not. But when I went to the Savior's Day conference, like Minister Farrakhan talked right through the Asr and the Maghrib prayer. The Asr is the late afternoon prayer. The Maghrib is the okay, fourth gotcha, evening prayer. Gotcha. I mean, he talked right through that. So my point being that if the, if the leader of that movement is not leading by example, I, I don't expect, I don't expect the lay person, the lay card carrying member of Nation of Islam to say, well, I'm going to excuse myself now from Farrakhan's lecture because I'm going to miss the evening sunset prayer, right? I mean, I did that, but that, that's not what, that's not what the, the people there were doing, right? So, I mean, it's a long way of posing a short question, which is when, my brother, when, and what maybe, per, I mean, maybe you can't answer for other members, but you can answer for yourself, like what prevents you from dropping in on a Friday Juma prayer, the afternoon prayer at your local masjid, your local mosque, um, and just learning more. And also just one more thing I wanna throw in there, which is very important because I've heard this a lot from the nation of Islam. They say, well, the Muslims from the East don't understand our story. The Muslims from the East don't understand our challenges as former Christians. The Muslims from the East don't understand what it means to be black in America. But again, a lot of this language is very outdated. It made sense in the 1930s. 
it made sense in the in the 1950s and the 1960s. But now, as I said, there's 2 million African American Sunni Muslims, right? So if you don't want to learn it from an Arab or a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi, no problem. Go to Imam Warthuddin Muhammad, go to his community, right? Go to Malcolm X's grandson, right? He's a, he's a black, he was, he passed away now, Mela Grant in Jannah, but he's a black American. He was a black American Muslim, right? Um, even when we talk about the East and the West, this dichotomy, it, literally, it's not black and white. When we say go to the East and study the Islamic knowledge, that could be Senegal. That could be black Senegal. That could be black Nigeria. That could be Somalia, right? Um, so I think a lot of the, that, that language of, no problem, a lot of that language of Muslims from the East, uh, it strikes me as being slightly outdated. Because like, where do I fit in? My parents came from Pakistan half a century ago uh, to Canada. So what am I? Am I Western? Am I Eastern? If I had to answer that question, I, I actually, I say both. I, I am Eastern, but I am Western too, right? And we're here, we're sitting here, we're talking in English, and I think we're understanding each other. So Indeed. I think in 2021, I think there's less excuse, I think, to not kind of move on and continue in that journey and to acquire uh, knowledge of, of the Orthodox faith, right? Of Orthodox Islam. And if, you know, if it was 1930 and uh, someone died and they just had a little bit of information about Islam, maybe Allah will forgive them and Allah will be merciful and say, well, he was striving. This guy died and he was striving for the truth. He was trying to arrive at it. Right. But in 2021, um, it's probably, I'm not probably, it's it's much harder to find a Moorish science temple than it is to find a masjid, right? A mosque. It's much harder to find a nation of Islam temple or a mosque than it is to find just a regular mosque or masjid, right? Um, so it's very much at this point going against the flow um, to, 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 uh, to avoid the Jummah prayers, the five daily prayers, fasting in Ramadan, uh, doing the Hajj. Non-Muslims know about this. Like the non-Muslims at this point know about this. You can ask my Jehovah's Witness neighbors um, who speak broken English. They're from Portugal. And you ask them, when do the Muslims fast? And they'll say Ramadan. Because we read yeah. that in the newspaper all the time. It comes on <laughs> CNN all the time. How many times do Muslims pray in the day? Five times. What language is the Quran in? Arabic. Like non-Muslims know this, right? So at this point, my brother, and this, like I said, this is tough love. But I think we can't just be content to say, well, at least we know this much and we're working with that. No, no, no. There's, it's, it's there for you now to grab, you know. Uh, thank you. Um, the simple and short answer is, uh, is that the time is now, you know, and, that, and that's, that's essentially partly why I have been, you know, making more of an effort to reach out uh, to Muslim brothers and sisters is because there is no excuse to wait on gaining more understanding and and you know really embracing Islam and in, in, in all aspects of our lives. Um, that being said, I also have to acknowledge that there is a level of um, for lack of a better word foreignness uh, um, if, if if you understand like it to look at a masjid, um, to see Muslim brothers and sisters, it does it does have a feel or a sense of foreign, like this is, this is from the East, this is not our culture per se. And then there's also another aspect that it doesn't feel like, not that we are unwelcome, but that there's no one actively saying, hey, you know, please come, come learn, come, you know, come study. Hey, did you know about this? And, you know, this is uh, to the point that I, I am wanting to be more active in, in encouraging Muslim brothers and sisters and a bit of tough love to, to, to you is when can, or I don't want to say when, as if it's a um, putting an obligation, but it would really be helpful if there was Muslims that were uh, uh, reaching out to so-called African-Americans and, and, and building and speaking about 
the story of Bilal, you know what I mean? And understanding that, no, this isn't an Arab, um, you know, because a lot of us seem to believe that it's this Arab thing and it's just for the, you know, the paler complexion uh, brothers and sisters and the people in the East, it's not for us, you know what I mean? But when you do the studying and you, you actually look into the history of Islam, one, the idea of race and, you know, these different kind of statuses based on your skin is just not there. But more importantly, you see that dark skinned brothers, um, you know, like Bilal had a extremely important role in uh, the history and the growth of Islam. Um, you understand that there's countries like Senegal that are Muslim, you know what I mean? That there's African countries that are predominantly Muslim that, um, uh, forgive me, I, I, I think it is um, the, the woman that took care of Prophet Muhammad after his mother died. Um, the, the, um, it could have been possibly Um Ayman, maybe Um Ayman. I, I, but but it was a, a woman that, if I'm not mistaken, Prophet Muhammad's biological mother passed when he was young, and then there was another woman that was there to help take care of him and raise him, and that woman was of African descent or dark or yeah. dark skinned woman. Yeah, it it, I, it was Um Ayman. Okay, got it. Um okay. Ayman. Her name was Baraka bint Thalaba. Bar she was Bar known as the mother of Ayman, Um Ayman. And you're right. She was of Ethiopian descent. And Ethiopian. the prophet saw her as a mother figure. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, you know, just those two examples, Bilal and, and that sister. Um, I, I say it one more time for me. Yeah, yeah. I'll put it into the chat as well, too. For gotcha. You. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, but that sister, if Um Ayman, okay. If so-called African Americans, if Black people, so-called Black people, knew something as simple as that, just that fact alone would make us. Well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I never heard that before. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like there's a there's a Muslim uh, store out here called Sultana Bookstore that I went to that I got my Quran from. And when I first went into the store, I was there with my daughter and a brother. I believe he's Pakistani as well. And he said. Uh, he said to my daughter, he said, do you know who the first president of the U.S., the United States was? And she said, you know, George Washington. He said, ah, ah, ah. it's actually a brother called George Hanson um, or John Hanson, excuse me. And if you look into the history, um, you know, the Continental Congress and, you know, the history of the United States is actually a, a African American, a quote unquote African American brother. It was instrumental in uh, helping to create what we now know as the United States of America. I don't want, but the, the point of that being is that I know that I said, man, that's, he didn't have to do that. It was nothing about us that came in that store that said, hey, let me drop this fact on them. But the fact that he did, it was like, I appreciated that because he was, I could see that he was uh, helping to broaden my, my daughter's knowledge of what's really going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that to say in terms of Islam, that would be really beneficial for us to make us not feel that it's foreign or that it's not for us or that it's some other kind of way of life. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And, 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 but, but again, and I accept that tough love, but you're, you're absolutely correct. You know, it's, it's our job is, and I, and I always say this is that um, like Islam does not belong to any one group. You know, it, it, it's not the property of black people. It's not the property of Arabs. The Turks don't own it. The Persians don't own it. This is a message of guidance from Allah for all of humanity. So it's our responsibility to share it. And absolutely, if, if you know, in a very polite way, in a very polite, indirect way, what you're saying is we haven't lived up to that responsibility. And I would 100% agree with that sentiment. You know, it, it absolutely hurts me and it pains me when I hear Nation of Islam members when I ask them the same kind of question, like what's stopping you, you know, from accepting this? Um, and, and there'll be answers which are not really theologically relevant, but they are psychologically relevant to them. And it'll be, well, like white Arabs didn't give us the message of Islam. White Arabs are here selling pork and alcohol in our black neighborhoods, this and that. Uh, but the thing is, the thing is this, as a Muslim, I disagree with that as much as you do. I, I'm sickened to the core as much as you are, you know what I mean? Um, 
so these should not become a theological stumbling block. You know what I mean? It, it's the equivalent of saying that there's bad Muslims. Of course there are, right? But I imagine there's bad Nation of Islam members. There, there's bad members in the Moorish Science Temple. So if, if we, by that logic, we just would not be able to join any group. <laughs> we would just become a self-enclosed entity or organization. So, and look, especially with, uh, Sunni Muslims, we are 1 billion people in the world, right? So I always tell people that you can imagine amongst 1 billion people, you're going to find porn addicts, drug mm. addicts, you know, gangsters, mafia people, like the whole, you're going to find the whole spectrum of everything. You will also, by the way, find some of the most hospitable people on this earth. You'll also find some of the most humble people on this earth, but there's a wide spectrum. There's good and bad, right? Um, so yeah, I agree with that sentiment, but again, returning a bit of tough love, I would say that, again, this work had not been done in the 1930s and the 1940s, or rather the, the groundwork for it was being laid. But fast forward to 2021, and some of the best well-known, respected uh, Muslim speakers in America are African-American. Mm -hmm. Like, not from Africa, as in historically African-American. Um, so right there in California, where you are, there's Imam Zaid Shakir. Uh, I think you're, uh, you're, uh, I think familiar with him. But uh, again, I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's based in California, right? So some of the um, excuses that previous generations of people may have had, you know, it's not the, it's not the same thing today. And also, here's a real, here's a academic I want to introduce to Dr. Sherman Jackson who's also known as Abdul Hakim? Abdul Hakim Jackson. Yeah, he's also known as Abdul Hakim okay. Jackson. That's he's, different than Abdullah. There's another Abdullah Quick, Hakim Abdullah Quick, Abdullah Hakim Quick, yes. Yeah, yeah, Abdullah Hakim yeah, Quick yeah, is, 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 uh, is from my part of the world. I mean, he's, he's from yeah. my city. Abdullah Hakim Quick, very. there you go. So yeah. these are trailblazers. Like these are... African-American Sunni Muslims who have made that effort, you know, who have made that effort. And quite frankly, they're better positioned to make that effort and that outreach than my parents were, right? Mm. My parents as Pakistani immigrants, they're just, I mean, they were concerned about establishing themselves and getting on with life and the plight of the indigenous peoples in the North or the African-Americans, that's just, it's not like, it's not the first thing on our list, unfortunately, but these respected personalities and scholars, they, they have already done this kind of outreach. Uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson, he's written two books on the topic of Islam in Black America. Um, okay. Now, I need to make the disclaimer that you better start saving up now for those books because they are like limited uh, supply books, like, like they're academic books that are meant for the university bookshop. Uh -huh. So they're I not understand. mass published. They're not mass published. Oh, yeah. And so each book is like $60, $70. But I tell you, every page is worth gold. It, it really is. And, and just, just to add on and to take some accountability, um, you know, there's also, we haven't been doing our job. You know what I mean? Within, you know, whether it be the Moore Science Temple of America and simply just following the teachings that Noble Draw Lee laid down for us as an organization. Um, uh, or following, you know, the teachings within this book. Um, but beyond that, you know, I realized and had to acknowledge when, within myself, I have been just afraid and timid to make that step to, to, you know, there's, you know, a few masjids that I know around where I live in my community, but it's still like, uh, well, I don't know how they're going to receive me. You know what I mean? I don't, do you knock? When do you go in? Um, you know, and in particular with my case, the whole Moorish aspect and understanding, it was even more of a, uh, I just wanted to proceed with caution to just to be as uh, humble as I could because I understand the weight, you know what I mean? I understand the, the seriousness of Islam and, and Muslims that actually that truly follow and about Prophet Muhammad being the last prophet. And, and so understanding that it's like, okay, I don't want to offend people. I don't want to, you know, make it seem like I am trying to in, in any way debate. 
Um, but I I had to acknowledge and, and have working to get over within myself. I just got to make the step. And, you know, speaking with you guys uh, on that call was really confirming to me that, okay, yes, you can have your perspective and you can speak to, you know, well-studied Muslim, you know, you know, people that are in the faith, you know what I mean? And they can, they are able to listen to you. They probably disagree with you, but you're still able to have that conversation and take a step forward or take two steps forward. You know, like now I have all of these references that I can go study and God willing, you know, my, my intention is to have more conversations with people from my community, people, you know, at Speaker's Corner, I, you know, Do Dr. Sherman uh, Jackson, um, or in, 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 uh, Saeed Shakir. There's another one coming here um, now too. Um, that, you know, uh, all of these efforts to, to further the work that's already been done. Um, and, you know, I also realized, um, you know, Brother Malcolm, he had taught, he had said often, it is the duty of those who know to teach those who don't know. Um, and that also, you know, that if all the prophets were sitting, if Moses and Prophet Muhammad and Jesus were all sitting in the room together, they wouldn't be debating over which one was the best prophet or which had the, you know, because they were all on the same team. They were all playing for the same coach, if you will. Mm. And you know, with that understanding, man, it really just, you know, kind of sunk into me that I right, get your ego out of it, you know what I mean? And, and come humbly and see how, you know, we can progress together. Um, and uh, from my position, I was privileged to go to a college and study communication. And I've had experiences with just different groups of people, you know what I mean? In the corporate world and you know, some celebrities here and there and just different, you know, working with the public. So I've, I've worked with all sorts of people and I feel, you know, I have had enough experience to be able to communicate with all sorts of people. And so I know I have to do more on my part in making the effort to, to meet with Muslim brothers and um, go to the masjids and start attending the prayers and um, and just learn and be more active and, and be more present so that, um, you know, the Muslim brothers and sisters, they can see me as well and know, and, you know, because maybe there's many Muslim brothers and sisters out here that want to help, but don't even know that there's people that, you know, are needing their help or that, you know, ways that they can help. So, you know, I have to do more on my part as well. Yeah, and, and to encourage you along the way, here's, here's what, I, what, what I want to say, is that despite your polite manner and your soft-spoken manner, the fact that you're wearing that red fez cap, the fact that you came on EF Dawa, which is watched <laughs> around the world, and you're telling everybody you're Muslim, so despite your mild manner and your, your polite uh, demeanor and everything, you are not someone who is scared to be different. So when you talk about the foreignness about uh, when you talk about the foreignness of the masjid, when you talk about the foreignness and how different it is, the way the Muslims from the East pray this and that, you've already made a life decision. You're not scared to embrace <laughs> different. You're ready to be different. And I know that there is this kind of there is this kind of pan African trend that exists there. It's already there amongst many Black Americans adopting African fashions. But the fez cap in particular that's still a pretty like it's a unique different look you know what i mean yeah. so uh no I, I don't think it should be a stumbling block for you the other thing is my brother keep in mind that shaitan the devil satan right shaitan he sometimes he can even try to use good things as a ploy or as a trick and to use it against us so for example shyness and modesty generally is seen as a good quality in islam it's a, it's a good attribute the prophet peace be upon him was shy but anything taken to an extreme can be bad there's a time mm -hmm. when you have to take shyness and throw it in the trash can i'll give you an example i'll give you an example generally shyness with the opposite gender and all that these are good things traits of modesty and so forth but let's say i'm uh let's say i'm driving down the road and uh 
and there's a, I don't know, there's a girl there on the sidewalk screaming for help, uh, for help. Or there's someone who has fainted. There's someone who's fainted. I've just seen him drop. And now my shyness kicks in. And I think if I stop the car and I put on the blinkers and I go out, am I just going to look like some strange freak as well? Could this just have been some druggy guy who's just passed? Maybe he's just drunk and he just passed out. Do I really want to get out and help him take that risk? People might think I'm with him. I'm with this drunk guy. No, no, no. That's the time to abandon shyness and caution and say, look, I don't know who this guy is. He might've just died. I don't know what his story is. I'm going to extend my help to him. I don't care if I look funny to the people around me. I don't care if the car behind me is honking because I stopped the car. This is a time to not be shy. You know what I mean? So when it comes to the pursuit of knowledge, um, shyness can often be an obstacle. You know, it, 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 it can get in the way. So there's a time to put it aside. And I've had to bite the bullet myself too. Believe it or not, you know, um, like if you told me 10 years ago that I'd be on EF Dawa and like the world is watching me and all that, it not, it's not, it wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. You know what I mean? But I felt there was a need and I felt there was a need for a Dawa channel that's based in Toronto. And so I'm just trying to do what I have to do kind of thing, right? So, so you can do that too. The, the other thing is, now, all of the advice that I'm extending here is just from my own thoughts. So I could be right. I could be wrong. If, if you find it helpful, take it. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're free to reject it, right? And I know there's some Muslims who will disagree with this as well, too. I, I make that disclaimer. But I would encourage you, like, may I ask what city you're in? Or? Uh, Oakland, California. Oakland. Okay. I'm almost yeah. positive. I'm almost positive that there's going to be a masjid, a Sunni mosque in Oakland, California, that is associated with the ministry of Imam Warth of Deen Muhammad. It might, I'm almost positive. Now, it might be a very small storefront, you know, shop that's been converted to the use of a mosque. But one advantage of going there is that, again, it might make, it might facilitate that crossing of the bridge easier for you. Because now when you walk in, um, people are not surprised or taken aback by your appearance. They are Black Muslims as well, too. So they might be able to better relate to you. You might be able to better relate to them. Some of them, especially the older ones with some white hairs in the beard, many of them are coming from a Nation of Islam background. So they understand a lot of the issues and a lot of the types of questions that you have. Like you were asking that day, I think on EF Dawa about a prophet coming to every nation, right? right? And so the implication of that, the implication of that is that there must be therefore a black African-American prophet as well too. So they have wrestled with these questions. They have already um, discussed and thought about these questions in depth. So they would better understand where your questions are coming from as compared to the average uh, Syrian or Bangladeshi or Indian Imam who, who doesn't, who hasn't looked at that verse in the way that you're, you might be looking at it, you know? So mm. that's just one suggestion. The other suggestion, my brother, is that whatever masjid you go into, because you're welcome, anyone who wants to come and, and pray is welcome. Um, again, shaitan gets into our head. So when you walk in, some people are going to be staring at you and looking at you a little bit different, Right. And this is where shaitan and the ego and racism and all this stuff comes in. Oh, they don't like me because I'm black. They don't like me because I've got curly hair. My brother, no, it doesn't have to be like that. Sometimes we look at people because they look different. They stand out. Sometimes we look at people because they're handsome. You're handsome. Maybe they're looking at you because you're handsome. My brother, if I go on a vacation to Somalia and I go into a Somali mosque, don't you think they're going to look at me twice? Mm, if indeed. I go to black um, uh, Central African Republic and I go into a, a mosque there, by default that mosque is what? It's black and it's African. They're not going to look at me or my clothing or my hat or they're not going to look at me a little bit longer than they look at the average person. So I'm not going to translate that in my head as, oh, they don't want me here. They only want black people here. They don't like the fact that I'm Indian or Pakistani. No. Let them look. It's They're curious. And remember, this is a cultural thing as well, too. In North America, staring is a bad thing. If I stare at you on the street for more than two, three seconds, you're going to say, what are you looking at? 
What yeah. are you staring at, right? <laughs> but my brother, America is not the center of the world. There are cultures in which people will just, they'll just look at you like this. I'm looking at the camera. They'll just look at right. you. <laughs> it's awkward. It's awkward for us. But they'll just look at you like that. And you're waiting for him to say hi, salam alaikum, something. No, it's just looking at you. So cultures operate differently. And you're right. A lot of Muslims from the East, so to speak, it's just fine to do that. It might just, it might be perfectly fine to do that. They don't think they're doing anything rude. So just have a tough skin. And if they look at you twice or they look at you funny, like don't, don't make anything of that. You have the right, you have the God given right to be there to pursue the truth and to find out what Islam is. And increasingly in our day and age, especially the large Islamic centers in, in America, they're used to people coming from all walks of life and different backgrounds and things like that. So I would really encourage you to put that shyness aside. And in addition to that, look at how Allah removes the, the stumbling blocks and excuses. He removes them. Now there's online learning, right? Right. Yeah. Which is not the same thing, which is not the same thing. But if you connect with a proper traditional uh, scholar. So again, I'll give you a couple of names online, right? There's uh, Dr. Shadi Al-Masri and his arc. Yeah, yeah, Safina Society. Um, so these people are offering, uh, you know, online courses as well, too. There's also um, Seeker's Guidance, which is free, and it's based here in Toronto. Seeker's Guidance, they do free classes online. Gotcha. And you could mix and match. You, you, could, you could learn... Islamic fiqh, which is the, the do's and don'ts, like the, the rules the, of how we wash and how we pray. You could learn that from Dr. Shadi al-Masri, and you, and you could be learning a bit of Arabic from Seeker's Guidance, which offers free online courses. So, you know, you could mix and match as long as we're progressing and, and learning. But Brother Rami, there is one very important central point that, of theology that I didn't clarify, which I probably should have clarified in the first minute. <laughs> And that is that as I skim read through the Circle 7 Quran or the Noble Jew Ali Quran, mm -hmm. I, I didn't find, see, a Muslim is always looking for a shirk, which is like associating partners with God. This is the, okay, um, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the biggest sin, idolatry or polytheism or so forth. And we're used to that with Nation of Islam having that kind of mixed message of the, the divine personage of Master Fard Muhammad. We know for a fact that many of them and, and, and almost all of the original members of Nation of Islam believed that this man, Master Fard Muhammad, was Allah. Like he was Allah in the flesh, right? Um, which is a, str a strange way of getting away from Christianity. Just, it's just you know, it's, that this is our main objection <laughs> to Christianity. Like God is not a man, God is not a tree, so forth, right? And often I have to explain to Nation of Islam members, again, that this is not about tribalism or color or race. If you told me that some Pakistani man, my parents are from Pakistan, by the way. If you told me such and such a Pakistani man claims to be Allah, it's not like I'm going to be all right with it now. Well, right. he's one of us. It's okay. Right. He's one of us. As long as Allah eats uh, uh, curry and roti and, and chicken biryani, it's all good. No, 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 no. That's equally blasphemous to us as Muslims. So the problem with Allah being a black man is, 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 is not black man or white man or Arab man. Just God being a man, we don't accept. But anyhow, as I skim read uh, uh, through your book, um, I, I, I didn't see any of that. Again, I was skim reading it. So I just want to clarify with you that your group is not one of those groups that believes that we are all gods or Allah is a black man in the sky. This is not your belief. You concur with us that Allah is the immaterial, unseen, unoriginated creator of the heavens and the earth. Is that correct? Alhamdulillah. Praise Allah. Exactly. Exactly Allah. that. Um, you know, and, and yes, there's only, you know, there's only Allah. There's no body associated with him. We don't believe that Noble Drali or uh, Farrar Muhammad or Fair Khan or any other person for that matter is Allah. Um, or is God and man or any anything like that? Um, and actually to, to your point, um, you know, I, I've watched several of the, uh, the discussions and debates about uh, God and, and Allah and 
you know, something that I see the atheists trying their best to, you know, find a way to disprove God and something in chapter one that when I first read it, it really hit me. It says, it says, um, the thoughts of Allah cannot be circumscribed. No finite man, no, no finite mind can comprehend things infinite. And I, and I found that, that line to be extremely powerful and pretty much ends any sort of debate with, to me, people that don't believe that there's a creator in that it's no possible way for your mind to understand the creator because the creator is infinite and our mind is finite. No matter how much you study, no matter how much you learn, you could learn 30 different languages and, and claim to study all the text, your mind is finite. So there's a limited uh, um, amount of information that you'll be able to grasp with your mind, point blank period. And with that, by default, you cannot understand something that is limitless, that is infinite. Um, uh, so, you know, just to, to, to further just, you know, solidify again, yes, we do not believe um, that uh, for our Muhammad or any person was a law in man or God in man, um, anything like that. And, and actually, you know, and this is all due respect to the different organizations, but in the teachings that Drew Ali brought, it says specifically, um, you know, when it's speaking about the devil, that the devil isn't some, uh, the white man, you know, it isn't, you know, don't blame that if you want to seek the devil, seek the devil within, it is your lower self. And you overcome that devil by seeking your higher self and doing all of the attributes and all of the uh, qualities that are, you know, of our higher self that are noble, being about love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. The lower self is the opposite of, you know, all of the things that harm us. So I, I point that out only, um, and this is again with respect, because with the Nation of Islam, that teaching got completely uh, rearranged or remixed and, you know, uh, subsequently they began teaching or some individuals began teaching that the black man is God, the white man is the devil. And that is where, you know, uh, eventually you hear Mal Brother Malcolm X, also known as El-Hajj Malik Shabazz, he initially started preaching that same thing until he went to Mecca. And then he uh, encountered and met and learned um, and was with and praying and eating with Muslims with eyes that is blue um, and hair that is blonde. And then he realized that it's not that that is the incorrect teaching that is not true as well and you know you can you know if you don't know the history he, he wrote a letter from mecca you know explaining such and then that's when he made his change to more sunni uh, islam and you know created his own organization and subsequently that's what happened with uh wallace steve for uh muhammad um as well he left as well and Ma muhammad ali is and so on and so forth so i just pointed that out to say that um that uh the initial teaching got remixed in, with these these uh later organizations um you know just to the point that, that yeah. noble dry lee seemed to be teaching something different than what they were teaching very clear. So, so I mean, no, this is very helpful for for the uh, for the Sunni Muslim audience as well to to understand that um, the members of Moor Science Temple they are not one of those groups teaching that God is is black or a black man or a white man for that matter, anything like that. And um, and the other thing, which is I'm glad you clarified that, is that Moor Science Temple therefore is not anti-white in that way. Does not believe that white people are a devil race or something like that. That's very interesting from a sociological perspective. And what I mean by that is that one would have expected that the earlier movement, more science temple would have been more heterodox and strange in that way. Um, because even when I told my son today that I'm gonna be talking to somebody from the more science temple and these guys were the predecessors to the nation of Islam. <laughs> I'm sorry, but his response was, oh, so they're even more crazy, right? <laughs> but, 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 but with all due respect, no, you're not, right? I mean, I, I, like genuinely what you're telling me uh, this this is a bit closer to Sunni Islam than the subsequent version, Nation of Islam, which kind of took a different kind of turn and interpretation of things. 
But again, even the majority of those members eventually came to Sunni Islam in the 1970s and the 1980s. And so what you have now is a smaller remnant, which is the Louis Farrakhan uh, faction is actually a smaller remnant of what originally was, right? Um, but on that note of, of uh, white people, I think, Rami, we struck a good balance of discussing similarities and differences as well, too, because these conversations often just sway to one side or the other. There's some people who are only comfortable d- discussing similarities and what makes us you know, the same. Um, and, and, they're, and, and they're uncomfortable discussing differences. But then similarly, there's some people who are only comfortable debating and refuting, and it's actually threatening to them somehow if they acknowledge that there's similarities, right? So we struck a good balance. I want to go back to, if not differences, maybe, maybe a point of slight tension, which is in the, in the um, uh, more Science Temple uh, book, Quran, in the, in the uh, Circle 7 Quran, I did notice that on the on the last page, it said, uh, this is point number six on the last page, we as a clean and pure nation descended from the inhabitants of Africa do not desire to amalgamate or marry into the families of the pale skin nations of Europe. Good thing Hamza is not here with us. <laughs> okay. okay, so you don't want to marry into the families of the, of the pale skin nations of Europe. And the rest of it's all good stuff. Neither serve the gods of their religion and and so forth and so on. So again, uh, I mean, I'll just kind of give my two cents on that. And then, of course, your opinion on on this is far more important. But looking at this as a Sunni Muslim, again, let me warn you, and I don't want this to put you on the defensive. The average Muslim will look at that and say, there you go. It's un-Islamic. It's wrong. It contradicts the Quran, contradicts the teachings of the Prophet. This group is some really... Um, misguided cult there's no hope for it so uh, don't let that stuff scare you off or put you on the defensive or put you into ego mode I mean that's just the way uh, life is right I'm trying I'm trying to kind of take a sympathetic approach here so my the way I'm looking at that if I were to take a sympathetic interpretation of that would be that as you said Noble Drew Ali is not teaching that white people are devils because he hasn't taught that anywhere else but this might just have been a practical strategy at the time for, um, for Moors to uh, get back to their religion, get back to their culture, get back to their way of life, which obviously can very easily become diluted when you start intermarrying with uh, people of other backgrounds and faiths, right? Um, so, um, so again, how do you look at that? Is that something you look at as written in stone? If, if there was a righteous uh, white Muslim woman uh, that you had interest in, would you disqualify her from uh, marriage because of her pale skin? Or um, w- would you take a more kind of liberal interpretation of, of what we see there? That's a beautiful question. Um, you know, my perspective on this, on that particular line, um, and just kind of the trail that it goes with, or that comes with it, is a bit different than I would say a lot of the Moors, um, a lot of other Moors in the community, because a lot of them take that line and use that as a, a way to try to discriminate and say, there's no uh, Europeans that are allowed to join the Moor Science Temple of America as an organization, which to me is complete. it goes against what Noah Dry Lee taught because in the literature that I, that I read from earlier, there's a line that says that here in the uh, United States of America, the religious door uh, swings open to all. And, you know, everyone should be allowed the, the pursuit to, to, you know, seek the, I'm paraphrasing, but to seek the, the truth and religion um, if they so choose. Um, so um, so a lot of people will use that and say, yes, yeah, see, this is saying that, um, you know, Europeans are not allowed into the organization where, from my, the way I read it and interpret it, I believe it's speaking more about in a political, um, in a political uh, uh, mind frame or state in, in, in the sense that they say marry into the, the pale skin uh, nations, or just uh, families, excuse me. Is it families? Let me double check this to be sure. I had it here. Uh, I closed it too early. 
pale skin nations, marry into the families of the pale skin nations of Europe. So, you know, one, when I looked into amalgamate, um, and then I think about marry into the families of nations, my thought goes into there's something to do with um, uh, descendancy, something to do with heritage, um, uh, uh, also culture, um, and, and to not abandoning your culture in the sense of um, <laughs> um, not uh, like giving up your name and taking on the family name of the family in, in, in uh, Europe per se. Uh, that's just like one example. So to me, that is more so speaking of, you know, don't abandon our culture and marry into this, you know, this family and this nation and take on their gods and their cultures and customs. No, no, no. Um, we're returning that to them because that's for their earthly salvation. Whereas we have something for our earthly and divine salvation. So it's not just simply, um, you know, for your salvation here in this in this earth in the temporary sense, but we have a culture, we have a creed um, that is here, that is for us. Um, but that being said, it doesn't say um, also that pale skin uh, European people can't marry into uh, the Moorish family or, you know, they can't, you know, they can't come into our nation, you know, our families of nations. So at least that's my perspective on it. You know what I mean? I, I can't say I'm the authority on it, but to me, it that's where I feel it's, it's leading to per se. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? It, it totally makes sense. And I really appreciate the way that you, that you read it. And, um, Again, I can't speak for all Sunni Muslims either, but I but I imagine that you know they, they would uh, appreciate everything that you're saying because obviously for us, intermarriage between different races is is not an issue per se. You know, it, it's something that is allowed. Look, here's the thing: I, I tell Nation of Islam members similar things that because certain things are allowed doesn't mean you have to do it, right? <laughs> you know, so if if it's somehow threatening, th th I'm not speaking to you now. I'm, I'm just speaking to this generic nation of Islam guy. If, if intermarriage and, and white people, you know, coming into the organization somehow threatens your blackness. Well, Islam is not saying you have to do it. Islam doesn't say you have to marry a white woman or an Arab woman. Marry black. Uh, and, and then because uh, a lot of the politics and theology gets mixed up for some strange reason. And so nation of Islam members tell me, well, we need our black businesses. We need our businesses owned by black people, not by Arabs. This and that. I say, go ahead. That's not. That's not. That's not what we're debating here. If you're a Sunni Muslim and you wanted black, uh, uh, you wanted businesses in black areas to be owned by black people. By all means, this will not invalidate your Islam. You know, uh, that's just your political social stance. You're entitled to it. You know what I mean? But what, what we're concerned about is theology and beliefs. You know what I mean? So. Marrying a white person is different from believing that Allah does not allow my race to marry a Chinese person or a Japanese person. That's what um, Muslims would object to. So I appreciate your answer. At the same time, I can imagine a bit of pushback uh, on that point. Um, I mean, I, I could imagine I, someone else from the Moorish Science Temple saying, well, that whole thing started by saying we as a pure race right? So no, there's something intrinsic about the more or about the black man that makes us more pure in Allah's sight. I'm just saying I could imagine that kind of pushback. And mm -hmm. as I hear you give all of these explanations, Brother Rami, I, I have mixed feelings because it's like when I talk to someone who self-identifies as a Christian, but they tell me they don't believe Jesus is divine. They don't believe mm. Jesus is God. Um, they, 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 so then I say, well, wait a minute, man. Why are you calling yourself a Christian exactly? Because you're actually closer to Islam. You don't realize it, but you're closer to Islam than you are to Christianity. So in a way, I'm tempted to kind of also ask you like, okay, why identify with this particular organization when in reality, I feel from our conversation so far that your beliefs, your feelings, and your sentiments seem to be much closer to that of a normal uh, uh, sorry, you know, mainstream I get you. I get you. I get you. but I have conflicting feelings because then the other part of me says that, well, 
we don't have a problem with a label or a name. We have a problem with wrong beliefs. And so if you can stay in that organization and help other people in that organization to just understand the, 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 the clear picture and, and what this is all pointing to, then, then does it really matter if you call yourself part of the Moore Science Temple and wear a red fez cap? And is, it, that's not the problem here, right? That's not our real issue. These are just the outward symbols, right? I, man, that's, um, yes. Um, I think about that a lot. I mean, to your point, this is maybe back in 2012 when I had begun, and just to be super transparent, I had my search for the truth began when I hit an extremely low point in my life and literally just uh, was walking on the street and dropped down and started praying to God saying, hey, listen, I don't know what's, I don't know the right way. You see, I'm messed up. Just show me the right way to go. I'm following your lead. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I remember it's like seven in the morning, just on the side, on the street in the sidewalk. Um, then now, mind you, I didn't, I hadn't studied Islam like that or to really understand that a Muslim in the true sense of the word is submitting your will to, a, you know I mean, to God. So it's like, I've, I had that. I had a, a, a Muslim brother named Muhammad in a taxi. Um, uh, I noticed his Quran. A, 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 a brother named Muhammad in a taxi. No way. Uh, listen, brother in, my, in, in um in Boston. I was in I was on the uh, East Coast, and um, I noticed his his book in the in the front and it had the uh you know the beautiful calligraphy kind of a uh, design on. It. I said you know what kind of book is it because it didn't have a a name. He said it's the Khan, and I said oh okay you know and I started asking him some questions because I was just seeking to learn more. And he said, um, he said, brother, are you Muslim? And I said, oh, you know, no, I wouldn't dare claim that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about different religions and I'm interested and I just bought a Quran, you know, but I couldn't, I wouldn't call myself a Muslim. And he laughed. He said, brother, even if you don't know it, you're Muslim. <laughs> and so and I, remember when he, I remember when he said that, I was like, uh, all right, you know what I mean? And, and by the end of the ride, uh, you know, I spoke to him about my name. Um, because obviously I wasn't given the name Rami Salam El. Um, but I was seeking to find a name that wasn't connected to us being enslaved to a, a European person. And he said, brother, a good name for you would be Abdullah. He said, most people, they'll say that it means a slave of Allah. But in essence, it's really just saying you're a servant of Allah. You know what I mean? It's not a slave. He was like, he was explaining um, that it's not a slave in the sense that you know, I'm probably thinking. And I took that and I said, well, I'm not going to uh, use that name just yet, but I'm going to hold on to that and, and do some more studying. So, you know, that is a name that I that I hold on dearly. I just don't typically use it uh, when I'm speaking to Moors. Um, but um, I say all of that to say, uh, to your point, that is why I'm so interested in learning more about Sunni Islam, uh, I mean, uh, Orthodox Islam or, um, you know, building with Sunni Muslims and just Muslims that have really studied Islam so that I can better understand, um, you know, these teachings that were given to our people and help, you know, do my part to guide others as well as myself on the right path. Um, because I feel, you know, as Brother Malcolm had taught me, it's the duty of those that know to teach those that don't know. And I know that I'm in a unique position to be able to study these different kinds of things and communicate it back in a way that is um, a little bit more digestible than some other people. And so, you know, that's kind of essentially where I am right now. But I've heard from more than a few people that, you know, say, Brother, you sound like you're right there being Muslim. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I, I understand. Definitely, that I, I genuinely, I genuinely feel that. And just a, a little comment on on the on the word on the name Abdullah, that even if we take that literally as slave of Allah, not only does it not have any connection to the idea of uh, unjust human slavery or race based uh, uh, injustice uh, or race based slavery it's actually a complete disconnect from the idea of human slavery. Because when you call yourself a slave of Allah, what you're really saying is, 
I'm not anyone else's slave. I'm his slave. And the mi- I'll honor you. I'll respect you. I'll, I'll obey you. But the minute you tell me to do something that goes against the divine commands, I'm obligated to follow that first and not what any human being is uh, telling me or obliging me to do. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really beautiful name in that way. And by the way, Brother Rami, um, your search, and even when you mentioned this kind of point of desperation, you know, that you hit, you just cried out to God for guidance. It, it, it's beautiful. And you, you physically fell down, am I right? You physically fell down. Yes, literally on the ground. Yeah. For, first of all, this is very telling as well. This is a point I share with, with uh, many uh, uh, non-Muslims, including Christians and members of other religions, which is that I say that, look, um, Muslims, obviously, we don't believe that God, God physically becomes a person or he incarnates. It's not befitting that God do that. But just for argument's sake, for argument's sake, let's say God was standing physically right in front of me. What would be your nat, the, the most natural instinctive re- reaction for you to do? Would it be to jump up and down and start singing gospel songs? Would it be to look for a folk guitar so you can start singing some country song? What, what, if God was right in front of you, what would be the most natural thing for you to do? Wouldn't it be for you to fall down in complete physical and spiritual submission and just worship your, your, your Lord? So my point is that this is one of the reasons we believe that, that human beings are, are inherently, uh, intrinsically Muslim. It's part of our nature to be Muslim because... As you said, nobody taught you that. Nobody said, hey, Rami, if you hit a low point in life and you want to be close to Allah, you know, fall down in prostration. You know, it's just something that comes naturally to the human being. Right. S- similarly, the way Muslims supplicate when we do what's called dua, supplicating, we asking God for things. Uh, again, you see the beggar on the street. Isn't this what they're doing? Like, can I have can you do you have five right. cents? You have a little bit of change you can give me. So we're asking God, we're begging, supplicating to God, right? And another thing that struck me is that your story, everyone's story is unique, yet at the same time, your story can be seen as representative of like the Black American struggle and search in general, because it's not only your family, as you said, it's a whole people that have been dispossessed and robbed of their ancestral ways and so forth. And Dr. Sherman Jackson, one of the names that I put to you in the chat, in one lecture online, like he made a very powerful point. And I won't be able to do it justice the way I paraphrase it, but he put it very powerfully, right? He said that, do you think it's a coincidence that the only Western non-Muslim country in which there is communal conversion to Islam is America, which just happens to be the most powerful nation on the planet? So what we mean by communal conversion, obviously, is not that uh, all the Black Americans have become Muslim. That's not what we mean. But we mean a sizable segment of African Americans have adopted Islam in the past half century only. And so the average Black American has either an uncle, a parent, a cousin, a second cousin, someone in their family that is a Muslim, right? So arguably it would be a bit easier for you to become Sunni Muslim than for the average white person. The average white person, if he converts to Islam and changes his name from Robert to Khalil or Abdullah, is like, what happened to you, man? You do it. It's like, it's, it's yeah, there's plenty of non-Muslim blacks named Jamal and Karima. And it's just, you know, so he, he asked the question, is it a coincidence that it's the most powerful nation on the earth which is the only nation that has communal conversion to Islam. And point number two, is it, is it a coincidence that the community that underwent that communal conversion to Islam in the most powerful nation in the earth just happens to be the only community, uh, the only American community that is not associated with the oppression and the injustice and the imperialism of that country? See, look, when, when someone in the world says they hate Americans, they're not thinking of you. Right. <laughs> they're, not, they're not picturing you, right? They're picturing a Donald Rumsfeld, a George Bush, or something like that. So in other words, Dr. Sherman's point was that the communal conversion of African Americans in Islam in the past half century is a modern day miracle. 
It's a modern day miracle that should be acknowledged as such, not only by black Muslims in America, but by every Muslim in the world in the same way that we don't look at the change that the Arabs underwent in the seventh century under the tutelage of the Prophet Muhammad. We don't look at that as an Arab um, uh, phenomenon. or, or so. We see that as Allah's intervention in the affairs of the seventh century Arabs and he transformed them and he changed them. Every Turkish Muslim, every Iranian Muslim, every white Muslim embraces and recognizes and acknowledges that miracle in history. So Dr. Sherman Jackson is saying in the same way, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm black. I'm saying this because I'm a Muslim. Every Muslim should acknowledge and embrace and recognize that Allah still works miracles in this day and age. And the African-American Muslim is a proof of that. It's a deep point. That, you know? it's, very deep. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely deep, especially when you factor in the propaganda and the media and the attack that Islam has been under, particularly the past 20 years, you know what I mean, 9-11 and all of that. But like, it's been a concentrated effort, you know what I mean, to smear, slander, you know, just completely confuse the understanding of Islam. And yet, and still, there's still people, you know, all the time that, uh, you know, apparently converting into uh, or being becoming Muslim or reverting to Muslim, uh, being Muslim, um, man, I have I have to really uh, think think on that some more because that is very profound. Um, that's extremely profound. And your you know story I mean? is, is is and this this could perhaps be uh, um, uh, one of our wrap up points because I have to pray the Usr prayer, which is the the late afternoon prayer here. Um, but um, like on that note. Um, you, so you, you are part of that story of that miracle of that intervention of Allah in, 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 in modern day, you know, America, specifically amongst black Americans, but that has affected other people as well, too. I mean, I, I've, I've met white Muslims who, when I asked them, why did they become Muslim? They told me they read the autobiography of Malcolm X. <laughs> mm. and, yeah. Okay. And one of the very prominent, uh, American Muslim scholars, who is white, his name is, I always get his name wrong, Farooq, uh, Ab Abdullah Farooq, I think Dr. Abdullah Farooq. I, I think uh, I know who you're speaking of. Yeah, um, elderly, uh, white, academic, uh, academically inclined, um, white Muslim uh, scholar. Uh, he, 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 that was his first contact point with Islam was the autobiography of Malcolm X. So okay. um, yeah, yeah, and, and Moorish Science Temple, of course, is a part of that story. And, um, and I think we should acknowledge it as such, that if you want a complete history of Islam in America, then yeah, we will have to mention at some point the Moorish Science Temple, just like we will at some point have to mention the Nation of Islam. But again, I say the same thing that I say to my Christian friends when they kind of get stuck on Jesus, is that if Jesus is the signpost, it means keep on moving, right? So here in Toronto, we have a big tower. It used to be the largest tower in the world, the CN Tower, the CN Tower in Toronto. So, I mean, if, if a group of tourists came from Japan pre-pandemic, of course, right? A group of tourists came and, 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 and they saw a sign that said CN Tower two kilometers that way. And now I'm totally racially stereotyping Japanese right now, but they just stop and they start taking photographs of this sign. And like half an hour later, they're still just taking pictures of the sign that says CN Tower two kilometers up that way. At some point, I'm going to be tempted to intervene and to go to them and say, look, th this sign is very beautiful, but like, like keep going, right? Like the real thing is there, right? So Indeed. in the same way, um, I can appreciate the role that Moorish Science Temple Nation of Islam has played uh, as a signpost. But like, we, you know, we don't want, none of us, this is not only for you, for myself too. None of us want to just get stuck in life at a particular point in learning. We all want to continue to grow and evolve. So we will pray for you. You pray for us and may Allah guide all of us, you know, to the uh, correct and full path of Islam and unite us as brothers and sisters in this life. And more importantly, as, as brothers and sisters in, in the next life. Indeed, um, before before we go, I just wanted to share uh, real quick with you uh, this book called The Diary of Malcolm X. 
Uh, have you heard of that? The Diary of Malcolm X. Yeah, so I have not it's, heard of it. Is the Diary of, Al, uh, of Malcolm X, um, uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz. So it had his, his Muslim name. It's by Herb Boyd. Um, and they literally um, uh, transcribed his journal, his travel journal notes. And they have images of his actual handwriting from when he went uh, to the East and he was meeting with a lot of different um, Muslim leaders and just different leaders uh, from the, the East. Um, I humbly suggest you, if you can pick that book up because it is, I don't even that would open up a whole nother box, but it is extremely revealing. Um, and it, it paints, it gives a, a even more context and another layer to just how amazing that brother was. Um, and it also, it, it, it uh, I'll just say it, it gives you, it, it makes you question a little bit um, the diary of, I mean, the uh, autobiography of Malcolm X, just in, in terms of what they decided to, to leave or, uh, or not include in that book. Um, but um, thank you so much for, for the conversation. I, um, I greatly appreciate it. Um, I hope that we can continue this, um, you know, and I will be, you know, taking uh, a lot of the wisdom and, and advice and just making that next, you know, more steps forward um, and not being as uh, shy about certain things. Um, and, so, and so, you know, God willing, I'll be able to uh, make some connections with some other uh, Muslims around this community and, and further uh, this, this uh, goal that I have. And, and by the way, Malcolm X was a light for me as well, too, as a Pakistani descended Muslim, too, because the 1992 uh, Spike Lee film came out when I was, I believe I was 15 years old. Um, and that's the first movie I just went to the cinema and watched by myself because none of my friends were interested in watching it. And I, did, I didn't uh, really know his story. I hadn't read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And watching that movie was actually one of the very powerful moments, you know, in my life. And it, it, you could say it helped in my religious awakening as well, too. Because before that, Muslim and Pakistani, for me, were synonymous. You see what I mean? So it had a bit of a tribal coloring for me, too. Islam was something that you did with your Pakistani family and your Pakistani circle of friends on the weekend. You know, it's an extension of your culture. Now, I'm not playing completely stupid. Obviously, I had a vague idea that there's white Muslims as well. I had a vague idea that there's some black Muslims. And um, obviously, Saudi Arabia, where we go for the Hajj, is an Arab country. The Quran is in Arabic. But I hadn't had many dealings outside of just our Pakistani circle of Muslim friends. And so watching that film really made me more aware that, you know, Islam is much bigger than my race. Islam is much bigger than my family, than my tribe. It's something that has continued relevance for, for all people in all times. Because if mm. this guy found it, this guy from Harlem <laughs> in the 1950s found it and it helped him, uh, then it's something I need to look at again much more carefully, you know. Gotcha. So, Brother Rami, thank you so much for your time. I didn't ex expect it to go on for this long, actually, but th that's a compliment to you because I found this very engaging and I appreciated your questions and your answers as well, too, to my questions. And please check your email because I'll just send you a one-line follow-up to this. It's an important one-line follow-up to this conversation. But I hope, inshallah, that we will connect again and, and talk again, inshallah. Uh -huh. I, I would love to, and, and hopefully I, I'll make it out to Toronto at some point. We can yes, definitely, definitely. After the pandemic, definitely. And uh, and I'll, I'll show you some good Pakistani Indian food, you you, you know? Yes. Please yeah. do. And, and, and just uh, to share, uh, just in closing, um, if nothing else in terms of the message that Noble Dralee was bringing, you know, the, the very basic is to love instead of hate, you know, that we are for peace and non-destruction um, and that we do our best to represent and live by the principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Um, and so God and I, willing that, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and I accept your, I accept your tough love as well too. So th this is not just something for the camera. As I said, please check your email afterwards. I would love to connect again. It can be for shorter periods of time, but I will be more than happy to show you the basic ropes if you when and if you're ready to learn uh, about the prayers and things like that i will be more than happy to try to extend some help to you uh, consider me 
I'm a very limited resource, but I'm an available resource. I'm there for you. And uh, just please know that. I greatly appreciate it, brother. Thank okay. you very much. Um, Take care. Uh, much love. God bless. Uh, um, um, as alaykum, brother. God bless to you. God bless you and your family. And apologies to whoever was waiting on you, whether that was family or friends. Thank you for oh, their time as well, too. <laughs> it's my son. Uh, it's all love. Uh, thank Take you. Take care. Walaikum salam. Take care, brother. Take care. Uh, thank you. All right. Peace.